Um, first, once again, I would like to introduce our host and instructor for the evening and also thank him very, very much um, for being a part of this program, uh, this particular uh, project yet again this year. Um, he's fantastic and um, a true community advocate. Um, Jasper Smith, author and educator, author of the Build Wealth Challenge. Um, tonight, we will be talking about retirement. And this is the last uh, topic of our series with Jasper, um, where our series actually continues for one more night, which is going to be next Tuesday, same time, same link. Um, and that will be an option for um, everyone to join us for a Q&A session with bank banking representatives, uh, specifically um, with the expertise of home buying, um, credit worthiness, uh, and investments. So we um, it, uh, would welcome you, welcome you to join us for that session. Um, I said, it's just as I said, it's just purely Q and A. You have three. Uh, you'll have three different um, banking officials to answer your questions um, in regards to those three topics. So please join us. Um, you'll probably receive something um, via email as a reminder, and then Simone will also post the announcement on the Occur Now website. Okay. So without further ado, thank you so much, Jasper. Take it away. All right. Thank you again, Charla. And we are back for session number six. And we're going to finish this thing up. And we're going to have a, a good discussion this evening around retirement. And again, if, if this is your first time joining us, my name is Jasper Smith, also known as Mr. Bill Wealth. And I am founder, director of disruption with the, with the Bill Wealth Movement. And this series was designed with, you know, with you in mind, right? Because I know that each and every one of us has very particular or specific things we're, we're working on or may, you know, may not have thought about as it relates to our financial plan. And so the whole point of this series was, again, to kind of walk you through kind of step by step. And hopefully it's been very useful to you. This has been a valuable use of your time. Hopefully you shared some information that you learned with others, because again, this is free to the community and we never, you know, we never seem to see like hundreds of people show up for these kind of sessions. It's the weirdest thing in the world, right? We, we can't even give it away, Charla. So we're going to keep, keep trying though. We're going to keep trying. And I think those who are supposed to be here are here and that's all I, that I can ask for. So uh, again, thank you all for, for hanging out with us over the, the last, gosh, a couple of weeks, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of content. So even after tonight, just let it all sink in, you know, let it, you know, uh, swirl around a little bit. Maybe you've already taken some, some steps forward with uh, a variety of things we've covered already. Maybe this was the one session you were waiting for, but you know, tonight, again, the sole focus is going to be on retirement because a lot of times we tend to, in our industry, we lump in investments with retirement, but what I still find is that clients of mine struggle with, with planning on both sides. And I think if you separate them, <laughs> then it'll make a little bit more sense. But because we sometimes jumble them all together, because a lot of retirement things we consider deal with investments. And so I said, you know what, let's break it out and let it have its own time in the sun. So <clears throat> with that, just like we've done with every session, uh, there's a, a poll question that I'll ask Simone to launch here in a second. And again, you know, we just want to see who's in the audience and what they think about this one question that I'll pose to you tonight. So the question is pretty simple, but Love to see what the group thinks. So if my retirement goal isn't met, I would. You only got two options. I know somebody's thinking, gosh, I wish I could get that third option, but not tonight. <laughs> not tonight. 
hot tonight. We just want to give another mm-hmm. couple it's seconds. Really close. It is 50 50. Yep. And again, if you're the person saying, gosh, I wish we had a third option. No, we're going to give you going to give you two. But tonight's session is in alignment with this question. Which I'll, you know, I pose this question to every retirement conversation that I have. Because we don't think about it. I think, you know, I. I have heard enough stories from my elders that just pretty much scared me into like putting money away for retirement. And that's the honest answer. And this was probably when I first started my career, you know, fresh out of college. I mean, it was pumping to my head, like start putting money away for retirement from day one, because they all said to me, you're going to blink and then you're going to be old. <laughs> and then you're going to look back and tell yourself, I wish I would have saved more. I wish I would have invested more. I wish I would have. And it was, it was weird because no matter who I was talking to, if they were over, let's say the age of 60, they all said the same thing. I wish I would have saved more, invested more. And I wish I would have gotten, especially like the life insurance conversation. I wish I would have got that when I was younger and I was healthier. Hands down, everybody, didn't matter where they were from, what color, what profession, what educational background, it was save more, invest more and get my insurance, like life insurance, get that when I was young and healthy. And yet I was like, if all these people continue to share the same three things, I think I should go ahead and just do it. So I I was fortunate enough to actually listen, you know, be around people who understood the language of money and really kind of pressed me on like, why wouldn't you do it? And they would always say, what are you waiting for? And so retirement is one of those things where this poll question, I'll go ahead and shut it down here. So it looks like... (laughs) Slight, slightly eked out here, ha, a little more than half are going to work longer. The uh, the other, the remaining folks <clears throat> are going to retire with less money. And, and as you all know, I don't like either option, which is why we're talking about retirement plan tonight. I don't want to work longer. I, I just want to call it quits and, and go hang out. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to have to work if I can avoid working any longer. But if I don't have enough money, got to do what you got to do. But some of you were like, hey, you know what? Forget it. I'll just dial back my lifestyle. So maybe I have some things I was planning to do in retirement. And maybe I just won't be able to do them because I didn't put enough away. So therefore, I need to maybe lower or uh, not lower, uh, reconsider the lifestyle I thought I was going to lead in retirement. And so I, I don't like either option. And, and again, sharing my personal story as to why I started so young was just because I I figured if enough people saw fit to tell me what they wish they would have done, I was like, I don't want to be that person. And yet I still find a lot of young professionals who are just more, more obsessed with just making a paycheck that they just, they can't see themselves getting older. And there were some, uh, some studies done by a lot of financial firms where they were doing like really like deep science, like why is there this disconnect around younger people and starting or thinking about retirement in a in a more serious manner? <clears throat> Reason being is that in your mind, you can't see yourself getting old. And so there's a disconnect, which means I can't see myself paying this old person money and that older person is you. There's literally a disconnect in your brain where you can't see yourself getting older. And that's why you can't see yourself putting money into a vehicle for retirement because you're like, "Eh, I got time. Eh, I'm good. I'll be all right. So that's that's why I asked that question, because, again, I I don't like either option, but that's why we're going to really talk about retirement tonight, because it is something that we need to really be thinking about, something that, you know, as long as you are still actively working, there's some things you can do. Maybe it's not everything you want to do. But we got to do what we can. You know, if I'm already in retirement, we'll we'll talk about that, too, uh, during tonight's session, because it it, it doesn't end there once you say you're done working. So it does not stop there. So to to kick things off, just like every other session we've done, my my goal (laughs) is the exact same. It's to change the way you think and feel about money in order for you to achieve financial peace of mind. Not going to change that goal for these sessions. If I can just open up your mind to think a little bit differently about retirement. 
to unpack some of those feelings and emotions as it relates to retirement, then a lot of us will probably be able to move forward. So let's hop in. Uh, I always love to bring a little bit of levity into these sessions, but this is it's kind of what happens to some people, right? We, we work hard, we work all these years, and then you, you realize you don't have enough. And, you know, unfortunately, this is the sad reality for a lot of people. It can be avoided. I mean, this whole series we've been doing is talking about financial planning. I've never said that one topic is more important than the other. All the topics we've covered in this series are all important. Now, in terms of you deciding which one is more important, well, that's that's on you. That is a personal decision. Some of you may have had some, some, some great planning already done. And maybe again, this is you know the one session, like, you know what, I, I need, maybe I need to rethink this. Or maybe you have those who are close to you who for whatever reason, did not show up to this series that was free. <clears throat> you, maybe you're going to be the, the person in your family to share the information to allow them to maybe see the light one day. Hey, you know, sat through this session about retirement. It's coming, just so you know. Just so you know. So I would hope that we can avoid the realities of, of images like these. And I think I think it's, you know, it's 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 funny in a sense because it's it's the truth, right? It, and it can be avoided. And, and we can make sure that when I'm ready to go, I go on my terms. If you want to work well into your golden years, have at it. But I'd rather you be working because you want to, not because you have to. And there's a big difference. I've met some, I got a client, she's, she's 80 years old, still works a couple hours a week. She doesn't have to work, y'all. She just doesn't want to be at the house by herself. So, so your husband's passed away, kids are grown, grandbaby, she visits on the regular, but for her to stay vibrant, she loves going out and doing stuff. And I think that's the life that I would want. She's not working because she needs the money. She's working to stay vibrant, to stay active, to, to keep her mind sharp. And there are a lot of people who well into their 80s and 90s continue to work, but it's, I would hope that it's not for the money. So here are a couple of concerns that really kind of I want to shed a uh, shine a big light on, and and the biggest one is is running out of money. <clears throat> That's the biggest fear for all retirees. They do surveys year in and year out. Number one fear is running out of money. So people are already come to grips with their mortality, but they are scared about running out of money. And, and, I, and it makes sense to me, right? Because if, if I've worked for 30 or 40 years, I now have to make sure that I'm going to be able to have income that can last me maybe another 30 or 40 years, but I'm not working. And so that's the importance of retirement planning and starting early is because we don't know what life is going to look like in 30 or 40 years, right? We still have that mental disconnect, which is why we tend to wait. I'm going to wait a little longer. I'll wait till I earn some more. I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. And time just keeps on going by. So running out of money is, to this day, every year they do these retirement planning surveys with retirees, biggest fear, running out of money. So we got to think about planning on the retirement side a lot more serious because I don't want this to happen to anybody. I want you to retire and make sure you have enough assets to allow you to live the life you want. But also, too, I, don't, I would hope that you never run out. That's my hope for everybody. Now, the second concern is healthcare costs. And this is the, it's the big unknown. Now, the, the, the figure that I showed there, uh, there are some studies that were done and they, they're usually in this range. If, if a person is uh, age 65, uh, life, life expectancy is increasing now. And so now we're having people live, a lot more people living into their late 80s, 90s, uh, and well over 100. And so that number 265 or 265,000 is just an average, potential average cost of healthcare in your retirement years. That's just healthcare, y'all. And, and, and the scary thing, and I get this, is you could be fine today, sick tomorrow. And unfortunately, and this is the reality is that some people, we just don't, we just don't go to glory soon enough. Like we live with ailments, with, with different, um, you know, we, we just go through a lot. 
health wise, right? If if you know any family members who have Alzheimer's, like they just it's kind of this slow slow burn where you're like, man, they just they're slowly leaving us mentally, but they're physically still here, right? Or if you got into an accident and then it takes you a lot longer to recover from a slip and fall. Like, I mean, I, I don't like to make the joke, but you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of elderly people who just slip. And we're talking like you, you slip in and it's a slight bump that you don't realize that broke your, your, your tailbone or broke your elbow. I had an aunt, a simple slip in the kitchen and didn't know her arm was broke for like a week and a half. <laughs> it was just kind of like my arm hurts a little bit and come to find out she had a broken arm. And so th that's just the reality. That's the nature of life. But it's that healthcare piece that is concerning to me because if you don't have the necessary assets, I mean, I don't know if anybody knows anybody personally, but healthcare is a whole lot better when you have money. Like, I, don't, I don't even think I can sugarcoat it. If you don't have a lot of money, you tend to not receive decent care from a health standpoint. And that, that's kind of the same as you go through life, right? That's why healthcare is so important. And that's why there's so much talk in the news about how do we figure this thing out as a, as a country. But look, I, I'm not going to rely on somebody else to maybe help me to get the care that I need, but I'll take whatever I can get from them. But I, I need to, more of the onus should be on me to do the proper planning. So that way, no matter what happens in my retirement years, I have some assets or some, you know, the proper covers that can help me along the way. Um, I, I won't do it for this session just for time's sake, but uh, Medicare.gov, and I'll type that into the chat. There are a lot of bells and whistles as it relates to, to Medicare. Uh, there's four primary parts, A, B, uh, C, and D. Uh, a is for hospital insurance. B is for more outpatient services. C is Medicare Advantage plans. Those are like private plans that can help supplement parts A and B. And then part D is the uh, prescription. So your, your medications. And so I just would advise everybody to go check out medicare.gov to kind of read through the different parts and, and understanding the programs that are available, the supplemental uh, policies and things that you can get if, if A and B aren't sufficient or you don't have private health coverage. But it's one of those that I would just ask all of you to take some time to explore. Uh, if you're over 65, you know, you've already probably been enrolled in it. If you are nearing age 65 uh, or within that five years from retirement, starting to look at Medicare, just so you understand. If you have uh, elderly family members, uh, parents, just making sure you're aware of, do they understand the programs and the, the vastness of our Medicare system? It's not, a, it's not the perfect system, but it's the system that we have. So the healthcare piece, again, is I would say kind of the second piece where I'm thinking about concerns that people have in retirement. It is this healthcare piece. And then the other, Social Security. Again, we don't have enough time to go <laughs> through all the bells and whistles of Social Security, but I'm gonna go ahead and type in another resource into the chat for everybody is ssa.gov. Now, the big question is what I have outlined here in parentheses is when to take it. So I'll, I'll give you, there's two schools of thoughts around this. It's personal preference. You know, you're not being judged by what you do. It's, it's, your, it's your benefit. It's your future. Social Security is one of these that some people feel like because I've paid into this system throughout my working years, I want to get my money as soon as I can because maybe I don't have longevity in my family. So, for example, my father, early 70s, he's really planning to live to 85. And he said, just in case I don't make it, I want my money. So he, he opted to take his right away. So he took a reduced benefit because of his age. He was eligible, but he took a reduced benefit. And, and I'm, uh, Social Security benefits are taxable, just so everybody knows it's taxable income to you. But he took his early because he, he'd rather take the income, pay the taxes, and then he's just going to reinvest it elsewhere. Now, on the flip side, if you wait, uh, I think they've increased the age now. They'll keep making adjustments to Social Security, but they've increased it now to age 70 as the full retirement age. And that's when you get your full benefit. So if you're retiring at 62, 63 years old, then it behooves you to wait to age 70 because 
you get a an increase, a, a bump every year that you don't take Social Security. I believe it's 8%. Now, some of your investments at the, at the bank or the credit union aren't giving you 8%. And Social Security is going to be this income stream that you're going to have for the rest of your life. So if you're trying to sure up your retirement plans, well, it, it could make a lot of sense for you to wait and maybe leverage other assets that you have before you touch Social Security. So just something to think about, but SSA.gov is where you want to go. Uh, anybody can go there now and set up an account and just see what your potential benefit might be. If I'm in that kind of retirement hot zone where I'm, I'm, I'm you know, five to 10 years out, or I'll say five to three to five years out, start checking it now because as you get closer, I'd rather you know what to expect from that guaranteed income stream before retirement comes. Like I, I want you to be so far ahead of this that you know going into retirement, I'm definitely going to wait till I'm 70. Get the full benefits. I'm not capped on anything. Uh, some of you may still decide to work. And so you're penalized to some degree if you're still working and drawing an income that can also affect your social security payout. So it's, it's these, these nuances with the, the plan itself that again, please go visit ssa.gov when you have some time, just so you are aware of the potential benefit you might receive. Now, for uh, my younger professionals, folks like my generation, millennials and the Gen Zs, if we have any on here with us, <clears throat> it'll be around. That's all I'll say. There's all this talk around Social Security is not going to make it. Look, our government always figures it out. Always. They've gone through a lot over the course of history. It's a, it's a thing we need to be mindful of, but also... This is why I stress retirement planning, even to my, my young professionals who are fresh out of college and got those, you know, they're, they're getting their first jobs, is we know Social Security will be around. Something will be there. That's, that's in my heart. They'll figure it out. But Social Security usually isn't going to be enough. And back in the day, it was. <laughs> you could be comfortable in retirement and just Social Security could cover everything. But also, life expectancy wasn't that long back in history. So people were actually leaving this earth in their late 60s, early 70s and not making it to 90, 100, 105. Like it just, the, the system has to keep evolving. And so just be comfortable that something will be there. But I need to also put in the work and the time to plan out my retirement. And then whatever I receive from Social Security, added bonus. Or it's, it's a part of that component that I'm thinking, I need to shore up some guaranteed income for the rest of my life. Well, how much do I have to Social Security? And then what else do I need to do to maybe shore up that number and get to that like retirement income piece that I'm going to need for the rest of my life? So just, you know, some big considerations here again is, you know, I don't want any of you to run out of money. Just think about the healthcare, healthcare costs long term and then be, be very mindful about Social Security and when you should or should not take it. All right. So the big question is always, well, Jasper, how much will I need? It's going to depend. There, there's, there's a rule of thumb that I'm about to share with you here shortly. It's an old rule, but it's it kind of puts some things in perspective. It's the 80% rule. And so what it says is you need 80% of what you're currently earning to have a comfortable retirement life. So the example I show you here is you earn 75,000, that means you need 60,000, which is 80%, which breaks down to 5,000 a month. I'm excluding taxes in this scenario. <laughs> so, so somebody always says, what about taxes? Let's just assume uh, we're good on taxes. So you, you're netting 75 a year, your net <laughs> yearly is 60,000. And so net after taxes, you're, you're bringing in, you're bringing in $5,000. So every, every time I don't bring up taxes, somebody always hits in and we got one in the chat. <laughs> so, so yeah, so just, just giving you an idea, giving you a number to take a look at. But when people say they don't want to think about retirement planning, I think about this number right here because you, you got to think about it from two, two sides of the coin. So some of you may say, I don't think I'll have uh, as inflated of a lifestyle in retirement. So I can probably get by and have a decent life on 80% of what I was earning throughout my working years. And then some of you will say, I need everything I'm making right now and then some in retirement. 
And so we'll have, we'll have this, this all this variation, this continuum of what you think you need, which is why planning in general is always and should be unique to you. Because some people will say, well, Jasper, you know, I live here in California and I'm going to retire uh, on an island in the Caribbean. Great. Cost of living is a lot lower. Taxes a lot different than California. You know, I, I have intentions of retiring in North Carolina. That's where I'm from. Like, California's nice, but uh, taxes ain't that great here yet. <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit, you know, money can go a little bit further in the South or somewhere else not called California or maybe New York. There are just certain areas that depending on where you decide to stay, it's going to cost you. And if you're from California and you never want to leave, don't complain about it being expensive. It's just that's the reality of where we live. Right. And I hear this. I just I can't see myself living outside of this area. Well, how are we going to survive? I don't want people to struggle just because you, you, you've got options. But 80 percent is, again, this is a, a rule of thumb. It's not a perfect world, but just think about this number. Is it too is it too too low, too high? That's for you to decide. So here's another number. This was a, it was an idea that was shared to me pretty early in my career. Like actually my first job out of college, this the sales guy came in and he, he asked the question, like, how much do you think you'll need to eat in retirement? And I was like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know. But eating is a necessity, right? And it, it really falls into this, how much will you need in retirement question. So this rule is, I'll share it with you all now. It's called the rule of 219. Now, before I go through the rule, it's like any other rule, there, there are a lot of assumptions made. So please don't pick it apart. But I know some of you won't be able to resist. Don't pick it apart. But it's another rule that helped me when I was 21. It put retirement planning in perspective for me at 21. And so the rule 219 says this. There, there are... Two yeah. people. So here's my response. And these two people. Uh oh, somebody. Here's said. my response before I send it. Hold on. Can we, uh, hold on. Let me meet Christina. <laughs> All right. I had to meet you, Christina. Okay. You're about to send a message to somebody, but we can hear you. So we got you. All right. So, so there's two people. And these two people are 65 years old. And they just, they just retired. So we got two people. These two people eat three meals a day. So two people eating three meals a day. That's typical. Some people do two, some do one. But again, we're making a lot of assumptions. So two people eat three meals a day. And each one of those meals costs $5. Now, we're not eating anywhere fancy. We're doing value meal stuff, corn store. We're doing snacks. We're not probably not eating that healthy. But Three meals a day for two people at $5 a meal. And in this perfect scenario, both of these retirees are going to go off to glory in exactly 20 years or 80, at age 85. And I know that there are 365 days in a year. So if we do some simple multiplication, two times three times five times 20 times 365, that equals $219,000. That's how much it's going to cost you to eat in retirement. I'll be honest with y'all. That number scared the hell out of me at 21. Like I, I'm so, I was new to the industry. And when he, when the, when the gentleman shared it, he said, but think about people who say they're going to wait to start putting money away for retirement. That's just to eat. Just to eat. So if you all saw the other number of potential healthcare costs at 265000 now we just, you know, that's just healthcare. Then you add on this low number of 219,000. Let me, I mean, think about this, y'all. Think uh, we, we haven't, we haven't included a lot of a lot of other things in our life. But if I just add those two numbers up, that's 484,000. Let's just round up to a half a million dollars. Think about all the other stuff we've excluded from our retirement plans. That's just healthcare and food. So when people say, Jasper, I'll, I'll, I'll get started on retirement a little bit later. Well, good luck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so 
I was scared. I'm just looking at the chat. I was scared. This, this scared me at 21. So I, I may not have fully understood what my 401k could do for me, but this scared me enough to start doing it and adding more and learning about investments. But think of how many people weren't as fortunate to start their career in financial services and hear something like this at 21. I got lucky, y'all, that I chose a certain career field. Because this scared me. This scared I, first. I picked it apart. I was like, "Well, one, what if I'm not married? Two, you know, you know." I started making. I, I start. I started trying to rationalize. Like, how can I figure this out? And the guy was like, "Stop, man, stop. It's just a framework." Because in our brains, we want to pick it apart. And well, I'm not going to be married. I only eat two meals a day, and five dollars is ridiculous. I, you know, the goal is not to pick this apart. The goal is to if this doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. I don't know what, what it scared me at 21, y'all. Scared me. And so when I talk to my clients around, do you think you're saving enough or you know, investing enough and putting enough money away for retirement? I'm literally thinking about this number. Some people just won't be able to eat comfortably. Now, if you're like, hey, I want a birthday meal and uh, an anniversary dinner, nah, five dollars. Mm -mm, mm -mm, nothing fancy. No, dollar value menus is all we're doing. So th this is why, again, I segment out retirement by itself because it helps you to focus. Because we have all these competing priorities, they all need some attention at some point. So imagine if, just imagine if you started a job and you went through this six-part series and we just kind of picked apart each item and topic. What do you think would happen to those professionals in 20, 30 years? If, and I'm not saying they were all gonna be perfect, but just the fact that they were exposed to this information about the importance. Because all you gotta do is now go ask your friends, like, hey, what are y'all doing? You know, what do you think about retirement? Because I heard this story today. This guy said, I'm not gonna be able to eat if I don't have 219,000. Yeah, it scared me, y'all, at 21. So think about or consider the 80% rule. And then think about the rule of 219 when you think about how much you'll need. The number, the, the honest answer is nobody knows. So I, I would hope or suggest or highly recommend that you really take retirement planning a lot more serious because unfortunately, people are going to get to that point and then you'll, you'll be the person that says, I wish, wish I would have done that. You know, this is why I, I, I really wish I could reach more younger professionals because this is the, the memo they're not getting. This is the memo they, they, they rarely will receive. So how much, you know, let's figure out the number. And if you're, you're really wanting to like dial in and really find out your number, there are some phenomenal retirement calculators all across the internet. If you just type in retirement calculator, a lot of financial companies offer them right on their platforms because they want you to explore. You, you can make a lot of assumptions about rates of return and, you know, how much you're putting in and what do you expect, you know, how you were invested. I mean, there are a lot of considerations, but at least it'll give you an idea. Again, it's just a calculator, it's making assumptions, but it'll give you a little more comfort and understanding kind of where you are on your retirement planning journey. So the next question I ask people is, you know, are you on track? And if you are trying to figure out like when is a good time to really take a look at my retirement plans, I'm gonna err on the side of at a minimum once a year, minimum, minimum. Once a year, you should be reviewing all of your retirement accounts and plans to make sure you just understand what you're doing. Now, if you want to be a little bit more hands-on, I would push to say maybe twice a year. And if you want to go a little further, just quarterly. Because every quarter, if you have any type of retirement account, you receive a statement in the mail or you know through, um, through email. Most of y'all probably just hit delete or throw it in the trash. <laughs> People don't even look. I mean, I've got... <laughs> I had a client one time. She was like, I haven't checked my retirement account in 20 years. I'm like, how you doing? She was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I don't think you should be saying I don't know when retirement was kind of around the corner for her, but she just was not looking at it. And I find that quite a bit where we just, we're not even tuned in to what we're doing. And yet we have things that are out there. So if I'm trying to figure out if I'm on track, you know, do I have a pension or does my employer offer me a pension plan? These were great. But a lot of companies did away with them because they're too expensive. You know, that pension plan was you work for a long time 
And if you're the right age, they're going to pay you pretty good for the rest of your life. It's a great benefit. They give you a watch, maybe a mug, and then you, you retired and you knew you were getting your pension from your company and you were going to get Social Security. And that was typically going to be enough for you. But unfortunately, the, the onus is now on the individual because of the cost associated with keeping these pensions in force. So some of you may have a pension. It's great. It's really hands off from your standpoint. Somebody else is doing all the heavy lifting for you. But you also have options if you are in a pension plan and you retire, you can take control over that, right? There, there are options where you can start taking the money from the pension plan itself, or you could uh, typically they have like a cash out, like lump sum option in case you wanted to work with a financial planner to maybe manage the assets on your own or with the help of your financial planner or investment advisor. So you can always still rely on the employer to do it. But again, they're doing it based on what they think is they think you need and what they think should produce returns over time and be able to make these payouts for the rest of life for, for all these people. But you may say, you know what, I want a little more hands-on, individualized you know, advice and guidance with my retirement asset. But again, pensions, if you have one, they're great because it's pretty much hands-off from your standpoint. If I am self-employed, You've got a lot of different options. I just don't have enough time to go into all the various options as it relates to retirement plans. But if I'm if I'm running a business or I'm a business owner, you first want to consider like what it is that you want to do from a retirement standpoint, because there are tax benefits of you setting up retirement plans through or as an employer, but also in the same vein of having employees, would you want to allow them to have such a benefit? So you, you have a lot of considerations. There are some owners that, you know, have employees or staff, but don't offer them plans because again, they, they don't want to deal with the costs associated with setting it up or the maintenance of the plan itself, but you do have a lot of options. So if any of you are business owners or are thinking about getting into business and you want to have staff or employees, again, you have a lot of options you can consider if you're thinking about retirement planning from that standpoint. <clears throat> So the next one is kind of the, the big one that most of us are aware of. I, I like to call them the 400 series, but these are your 401ks, 403bs, 457s. And the, the titling of these accounts stems from the type of employer you work for. So if you're a private or work for a private company, typically it's going to be a 401k. If it's a nonprofit organization, typically you're going to have a 403b. If you work for a municipality, of some sort like the government or the county, it's gonna be a 457 plan. Sometimes they call them deferred compensation plans, but a 457, they all work pretty similar. They all allow you to put money away, perhaps on a pre-tax or Roth basis. And I'll, I'll talk to, about that in a second, but just be aware of you know, the type of account that you actually have. And, and I, I, I don't wanna make light of it, but people misclassify these accounts all the time. And it's, it's, it's these small things, I guess, maybe it just gets to me because I'm a financial planner, <clears throat> but I think you should know exactly what you have through the job if you have money in that account. You know, it's these small things about how we go about our, our plans and we got to think, do I, at a minimum, basic level, understand what I actually have and what type of an account it is? And I don't, you know, I don't judge people for not knowing because again, some people just, they just don't know. They've signed up for these things and never knew what they were called. But the key thing I want to make mention is if you get that company match, please, please don't miss out on the free money. It hurts my heart when I find that somebody has a, a matching contribution. If they did 4%, the company will match it. And <clears throat> people have made a lot of excuses as to why they can't contribute the match up to the match, not, not maxing it out, but just to the match it blows my mind. And so what I had to start thinking about was, let me frame it a little different. So if you get paid every two weeks, let's say you walked out your house and as soon as you opened the door, there was a stack of cash and you just kept stepping over it every two weeks. That's what I think about when you don't take advantage of the company match. You're just stepping over free money that the company is willing to give you. So if you, if you think about those retirement numbers that we're trying to reach or those goals or the, the, the dollar amounts, well, that's free money, folks. A lot of people are foregoing the free money, and I can't figure out why. Now, I'll spend a, a brief moment here on the pre-tax Roth 
piece. I, I don't have enough time to do a super deep dive again on this one, but pre-tax essentially says whatever I'm contributing currently, well, I'll put it this way. Both options allow your monies to grow tax deferred. Okay, so you're not paying any taxes year on, year in and year out as long as it's within this plan. But an employer may offer you one or both combination or both options as a way to put money into the plan. So pre-tax says, whatever I contribute, I get to deduct that from my taxable earnings in that year. So for example, if I earn $50,000 and I put in $5,000 on a pre-tax basis, in the eyes of the government, when it's time to pay my taxes and we'll rule out everything else, I'm paying taxes on $45,000 worth of income. So I, I, I did. I get that deduction. The monies are invested. They're, they're growing tax deferred. The government's going to get me when I retire. Or if I take, whenever I decide to take the money out, that's when the government's going to say, hey, it's time to pay that tax bill. But we deferred taxes for maybe our entire career. It's a great option. Now, what happened is laws change, which they're always subject to do. The Roth came into play. So the Roth said, I like this tax deferred piece. But I'd rather like just pay the government now. And when I retire, I don't have to pay taxes on that money. So Roths became very popular within the 401k, 403b, 457 space. So now in that same scenario, I earn 50,000, I contribute 5,000, but now I still pay taxes on the whole 50,000. So it's almost like I'm, I'm telling the government, oh, by the way, I'm contributing to an employer-sponsored plan, one of these, you know, my 401k but you don't get the deduction. And so in a, in a sense, you're paying the government every year. So when you retire and you want the money, it's all yours. So there's no one is better than the other. You just wanna make sure you're doing what's in your best interest. So if you need the deductions, you do pre-tax. If you're like, hey, I'd rather pay my tax bill now because I don't know where my tax, my tax rate will be when I'm older. So let me, you know, or in retirement, let me go ahead and get them off, off my radar now you do the Roth option. And some people do a combination of both. But you, again, this is why planning is very important because you want to think about what's in my best interest right now. Life could change. So maybe you change the type of contribution you're making. So it's not two separate accounts. So within your 401k or 403b or 457, you have two different options on how you can put money in. So it's not a separate account. It's just one account, two different ways on how money goes into the plan. So let's say you want a little bit of variety in your retirement plans. You can consider an, the individual route. So an IRA, these are beneficial if, I'll say two things. So the, the traditional, I would say, lines up with the pre-tax option. But here's the catch. If you are working for an employer that offers you a 401k, 403b, or 457, and you opened up a traditional IRA, you can't make the deduction simply because you already have a benefit that's allowing you to get that pre-tax deduction. So you're not, they're not going to let you double dip. So if I have a current 401k and I'm contributing, but I want some more variety with my investment options and I want to do an IRA, I can still put money into it, but I won't be able to deduct those contributions because my 401k is already allowing me to, do, to make that deduction. And hopefully that makes sense. Uh, in the same vein with the Roth IRA, I'm putting money in. It's invested however I'd like. And again, when I go to retire, I want to take out the money. It's going to be tax-free. Now, the Roth IRA, however, comes with income limitations. So if you earn too much, you cannot do a Roth IRA. But individual retirement accounts are definitely great options that everybody should consider. And especially if you, you know, let's say you left, let's say you've worked a couple of jobs and you have a couple of 401ks. Sometimes an IRA is a great placeholder to consolidate older accounts. So if you have, you know, you've worked four jobs and now you're on your fifth one and you got four 401ks or four three Bs, you can consolidate all four of those into your own IRA because the IRA stays with you. That's your account. Your employer doesn't offer you an IRA. That's you as a standalone citizen goes out and opens up this retirement option for yourself. So IRAs are, are definitely a great option that, you know, some of you should look into doing. If you want a little bit more variety by way of investments, people consider IRAs just because your employer plan is going to be a little bit more limited with the investment options that it has. The last one are annuities. These are, these are, are 
these are what I like to call the, the personal pension plan. So let's say you work for an employer that doesn't offer the pension, but we understand the importance of having some type of guaranteed income in retirement. That's where these annuities come into play. There, there are a lot of, I'll say, bells and whistles with annuities. Uh, the two primary types are fixed and variable, meaning fixed has kind of a fixed rate of interest that will be credited to the account every year. Variable uh, is really involved in the stock market. So based on the performance of the funds in the annuity, the benefit could be a lot higher over time, or it could be lower depending on how it's structured. Annuities are, are decent options. Again, if you don't have that pension plan, it's a great option to consider. If I'm a younger professional, I, I it's not a great option simply because you're paying for a benefit. Like that benefit is protecting and ensuring, assuring that you're going to have this income stream. But at a certain like at a certain age, it just doesn't make sense. You're paying for a benefit you don't need for like if you're in your 30s, you don't need an annuity. I mean, I meet people who have them and I understand their rationale, but you're paying for a benefit that you really don't need for maybe another 20 years. So if I'm in my early 50s, getting close to retirement, annuities might make a lot more sense in terms of locking up some money that can produce that guaranteed income. Because again, if I don't have a pension, you know, and social security might not be sufficient, what other guaranteed income streams am I setting up? But at a certain age, I shouldn't be paying for some of those guarantees. I should just be investing in the market. But as I get closer, I might say to myself, okay, okay, I need to be mindful. <laughs> I need to be mindful of my income, you know, the, the amount of accounts that I have, the, the dollar amounts. An annuity might make sense a little bit later. Uh, when I was talking about that pension lump sum option, could be a good option if you're like, I, I want to stay in control of what the pension was going to do on my behalf. An annuity ends up being another great option so you can have more control <clears throat> over the money and the investment selection. So annuities sometimes get a bad reputation because of the fees, but you know, you're paying for a guaranteed income stream. I'd pay for guarantees. I mean, that's what you're paying for. So again, a lot, a lot of bells and whistles that come with annuities. If you're of a certain age, it's the one thing that a lot of salespeople throw in your face. Hey, do you have an annuity? Hey, you want to roll those ass assets over? Do you have an annuity? It's, it's just the nature of the industry. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Hi, how are you doing? Um, well, I'm 58 and okay. I never had a retirement plan. Okay. And um, I just went last week to uh, get a Roth RA and I was advised not to, I was advised just to get a CD account because since um, the scale is going up and down now during this time, depending on because i had to put the whole seven thousand in mm -hmm. so um they said with the scale going up and down within a year you might lose a thousand you know yeah you can gain but then you might lose it which has been your first time you never had a retirement plan ever because i never worked until 2012 you know mm -hmm. um they was like we'll just go ahead and get a cd account and let me ask so you what your advice to that well let me ask you <clears throat> was this at a bank or a credit union yes yeah, a credit union of course okay so they're playing safe and secure because some credit unions don't have a connection with a financial planner or they don't do investment related business maybe at that location. And so it's a way to kind of keep assets at the institution. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just the, the question I would always ask people is what's the goal? So we got the goal of putting money into a retirement vehicle. However, if you want the money to grow, which everybody wants, you should take some risk. And we, we talked about risk during the last session. Not sure if you were there for the last session. No, I, I just came in 30 minutes late because I didn't even know this was for me. That's I, okay. had to, I had to go to the school and ask the school that they send me this email because I, I was like, is it, I, I know that says my school, but I'm not sure. That's okay. Then I was like, is this, is this my kid's school? You know, so I was asking my daughter where to come from and she didn't know. And then I asked my counselor for the kids' school, and they didn't know. So then I asked my teacher from O'Kern, and he said, oh, no, that came from us. And I was like, oh, okay. So then I registered. Yeah, so so here's, th thank you for sharing that, by the way. So here, the, the question really, the question is, I can leave money safe, but I forego the opportunity for that money to actually work for me. Even a novice investor can be conservatively invested 
And, and what happens is there's nothing wrong with the CD, right? There's nothing wrong with it. The problem is over the long term, you're going to lose out to inflation. Now, I know safety and security makes us feel good, but then we don't make any money. So we fast forward 10 years from now, the oh, stock market is oh. going to do a lot of things. And history has shown that over time, having money in the market will produce better returns than that CD. So I think it's a great start. I would maybe start to have some more discussions with your credit union about at what point do they think it makes sense? Again, I'm not your financial planner, but I'm just kind of giving you some general things to, to kind of ask your, your representative there at the credit union. Like, does this really make sense in the long run? Because if my goal is to make money, the CD is going to really limit my growth opportunities, if, if that makes sense. Well, I tried my actual bank, which is Citibank, and they was they wasn't they wasn't really um, trying to help me out with anything. They was like, you got to go through, on, in, on internet. I don't know how to do internet, so they was like, you got to go on internet and fill out the application and deal with them. We don't deal with them directly. So I was like, okay, I can't get Citibank to help me. So then I called my credit union. It was like, well, come in and we can help you, you know. And so that's why I want my credit union because they were willing to sit down and talk to me and explain things to me. Yeah, yeah, and and, and so. Credit unions definitely can be sometimes friendlier than the banks. It's, it's, it's always a case by case, right? Location type of thing. I just think sometimes because certain institutions don't want your money going elsewhere, they make a strong case for whatever they can offer you. And sometimes yeah. they limit the options. Again, um, Reba, is it, I'm a financial planner. So I, I act as what's called a fiduciary where I want to do what's really in the best interest of my clients. There are a lot of things that are suitable. So I think this CD... If it was an IRA CD, I think it's suitable for you. It's suitable for everybody on this session. But I think there's some things that should be done because it's in our best interest. So as a like a practitioner, again, suitable option. You're just starting out, want to get comfortable. But if I were to take you and then somebody else in this session and do, let's say the other person opted to do an account with me and I invested it conservatively, like within a year, you'd be mad at your credit union because I know the stock market is going to outperform that CD. Yeah, they, they said I, they said next year, April, I can take it out or keep it in. I have seven days. So okay. um, I, so at this point, I'll, I'll just leave it in for that year. Yeah, yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm never in a hurry to make quick decisions, but just over the same course of time. And maybe this is a conversation you, you, you rehash with them and say, look, I'm going to watch to see what the stock market actually does in this next year. And then. You, next year, I think it might be. I think it might be worth you moving it to another option after you've had it in this account for a year. Well, they did it. They backtracked it to 2021, so they okay. said I could put another seven thousand in this year, and I was like, okay, well, I'll do that sometime in November. So, um, my question to you is: there any way I can call you or contact you, or email you, and, and you know, talk one on one as far as either email or phone? Yeah, yeah, I'll share my email in the chat with you directly. And um, yeah, we can definitely connect. Um, I'll, I'll make sure we do that for you. Okay. All right. No, I appreciate that. And um, thank you for sharing that too, because we, we talked about during this series around the importance of having like professionals, like multiple financial professionals around you, because I think sometimes we, if we don't pursue enough in terms of options, then people get this kind of one option but don't understand that it may have been like three or four more options we could have considered. And I'd rather people explore more options. So then at least we've done the necessary work up front. And even if you choose the CD at the end, at least you've been exposed to the other ones. And I just think sometimes certain institutions and they all have the good folks and bad folks. It's just sometimes they limit the, <clears throat> sometimes they limit the, the, the level of, expertise they, they 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 limit it for some reason I, I can't always say why but it is a important thing for you to understand that having a relationship with a financial professional and maybe multiple can be very very useful <clears throat> all right so i'm gonna pause it for a second y'all so the folks that occur before i go into the buckets there are only a couple more slides that i want to spend some time on but I did know that Charla wanted to do a kind of like a, an exit survey. And I think it's only a couple of questions. So I, I think they might already have it ready to, to pop up. But uh, let's take a few moments here to, to go through these, uh, these poll questions. I'm going to take a quick breather here. 
by everybody, give everybody plenty of time to, to knock out, I think it's what, uh, five questions. So, so yeah, so if everybody wants to take a quick moment, <clears throat> we'll come back and I'll finish up these last two about the buckets and then we'll close this thing out. Thank you, Jasper. Um, and while everybody is completing the poll, just another reminder that um, this is our last session, financial literacy session with um, Jasper, but we have one more before we close out the full month series. And that will be with um, three uh, union bank experts. Uh, this will occur on Tuesday, same time and same link. Please join us. Um, it'll be a question and answer session. So bring your questions um, and they'll cover topics such as home buying, investing and credit. So please don't miss that and please, please join us. While everybody's still working on the poll questions, I'm gonna go ahead and answer uh, Sylvia's question. So how do you prepare for a potential market crash? Understanding your investments and where they are. I mean, it, it's tough to prepare really because you don't know when the crash is gonna happen, right? We couldn't predict that <laughs> Russia was gonna invade Ukraine six months ago or a year ago. So the, the, the goal with investments, even as it relates to like, general investing, <clears throat> retirement investing. This is why having, you know, an understanding of your investments or having some variety in terms of having multiple accounts, it helps you to weather these, these storms, which are always going to happen. And so, Sylvia, I, I can't recall, I want to, if you were here to, on, on the session on Tuesday, I showed a chart or an image of the S&P 500 returns since the Great Depression. And there are way more positive years than negative. Now, that's a long-term perspective. Problem is, you know, we kind of live in these windows where people are saying, well, it was bad. But yeah, right after it gets bad, it gets good. And so we got to constantly think about how we're weathering both of those storms. Because what happens after a crash is so many people sit on the sidelines and do nothing. And that's the best time to get in and buy more and double down and triple down. It's the best time. But if I don't have, let's say, enough income or cash flow, then maybe I can't get into the market after a crash. But the overwhelming majority of people do the exact opposite thing right after a crash in the market. We cannot control the market. It's going to have we're going to have good times and bad. I mean, honestly, it hasn't been the greatest year. The first quarter of this year, because of this war, performance hasn't been great with a lot of investments across the board. But it's not going to last forever. Nothing ever does. We've had 9-11. It was bad for a while, then it got better. So we're going to have all these things that come up in life. <clears throat> and if we can just remember, it's a long-term game, first off, but we, we need to be in tune with what, what we're doing. So when uh, market crashes or corrections or downturns happen, we don't, we don't freak out. But see, we don't understand what we're doing by way of investments. We freak out and make decisions that sometimes are not in our best interest. So even during downturns in the market, I just tell my clients, look, don't worry about it. And I say don't worry about it pretty casually because <clears throat> I remember when I was in my early 20s and I jumped into financial planning. One of my good friends was just starting out with her first investment account and retirement account. And there was like one or two, maybe two weeks in the market, it was bad. And her, she saw her account balance drop. <clears throat> And I said to her, when do you plan on retiring and taking this money? She was like, in another 30 years. I said, please don't call me again with this. I mean, I was joking with her, but I was like, this is why I was trying to educate her on the purpose of this retirement account specifically. It's going to take a lot of bumps, but over time, it's going to go up. So I said, yeah, you're going to have moments in time that it's not going to be great. But if you look at the long term, you should be okay. I think having the plan, to, to wrap it all up, Sylvia, having a plan helps you prepare, helps you prepare mentally.
because most times it's emotional decisions that we make with investments when things when bad things happen in the market. So controlling our, our feelings and emotions is, is a key way to prepare ourselves for any downturn. All right. <clears throat> All right. I'll leave the poll open. I think we have we got most of everybody. I'll leave it for another 30 seconds. If you haven't done the poll question just yet, just our uh, poll questions. Uh, this is that, that final one. Um, yeah, I just want to give another 20 seconds here. We got a couple more people who might have stepped away but haven't done the pool, poll. But, um, but yeah, all right. <clears throat> All right, so we'll go ahead and end that poll. Thank you all for taking the time to do that. I love pausing and doing these polls while we're here because you know when people log off, they're not clicking that email to do it. So thank you all for taking a moment to do that. <laughs> so we'll wrap this thing up tonight around the three buckets. And this is, you know, again, kind of firming up the different buckets, like where you're doing things by way of retirement planning. So we have the tax me now, tax me later, and tax me never. And we're all playing the tax game. Nobody's excluded from this. We're all playing this game. But are we all playing it the right way or playing it effectively to, to give us the best results in the long run? So, so here's the breakdown of, I'll, I'll say this covers just about everything. Of all the different accounts people tell me they have or are considering that they've done before. And I may have missed something, but I think I captured the majority of things that people will tell me they are considering using for retirement. And so you'll see there's a lot in the now section. So the now is, you know, whatever I earn, I'm paying taxes on it currently, if I made some money, you know, so those typically you don't find a lot of tax deferred options if there are any of these that are outside of a retirement account specifically, which again, this is why we have the employer sponsor plans in that later section, the traditional IRA, the annuities there that, you know, if you're into real estate, you know, somebody, again, you're deferring some of the taxes until you take the money or you sell something. So, so maybe we're deferring the taxes, you know, for 30, 40 years, but the government kind of just waits around and says, Hey, you know what? <clears throat> we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. And as soon as you're ready to take that money, there they go. You know, it's, the Roth, I should have said this too, the Roth wasn't always around. So if you're of a certain age, it was all pre-tax. You were just going to get taxed later. And Roth wasn't even in the conversation at the time. But since the Roth has kind of taken over in terms of popularity, well, it's a great consideration when you think about just the how our tax laws change and evolve over time. And I, I don't know, I, I would say we're in a pretty low tax bracket or range. I think taxes are pretty low right now, but will they be lower when I get older? I don't think so. So for me, I'm always trying to juggle like you and everybody else. I'm trying to juggle the, 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 the now, but also the later. You know, the never category, again, if my employer offers that Roth option, this is worth considering. And maybe it's not you know, if I'm if I'm in my let's say I'm in my 50s and most of my accounts are in that pre-tax option, well, maybe I leverage and maximize these last five or 10 years before I retire with some tax free money. So I know a portion of that's going to be taxable. This other portion is going to be tax free. So maybe you want to give yourself some of that freedom. And there's even what's called a um, you can do what's called a Roth conversion where you can go ahead and start paying the tax bill from, let's say, a, a 401k rollover. You can start paying the taxes now and slowly get all of that taxable income <clears throat> into a Roth vehicle. So by the time you're in retirement or shortly after, you've kind of paid a little bit of the tax bill every year to convert it over. And now all your money's free and clear, right? So that never category is enticing to a lot of people. But again, this is why you want to talk with an advisor, a planner, a retirement specialist, so you can think through all of these different things you might be doing or considering for retirement planning, how is it going to play out with the tax piece? So municipal bonds, I throw them up there, you know, not a popular thing that I've ever done for folks, but there are some super wealthy people who are, you know, trying to figure out how, how can they, again, avoid some taxes. Uh, you don't see the average investor really getting into municipal bonds. And then that last one, we didn't, again, get to go into a deep dive on it, 
But life insurance is another option that could produce tax-free retirement funds. <clears throat> if it's properly structured, let me say that. If it's properly structured, an insurance policy can be a great benefit for tax-free retirement funds. It's, it, it doesn't get a lot of fanfare because everybody talks about 401ks and investments and IRAs and everything else. But, you know, cash value life insurance is a great option that a lot of people should, should look into as an option. Um, but again, I share that with you because a lot of people don't. All right. Uh, give me a second here. Yeah, so Joan, thank you. I was going to mention that too. So here's here's the other thing when you, we're talking about taxes. So in the, this is a, I mean, actually I should type this in so everybody's aware of this. Uh, so they're called required minimum distributions required. So thank you, Joan, for reminding. I know I was forgetting some required minimum. So retire, retire, the required minimum distributions, or they're called RMDs, is when the government starts to force you out. And that force out happens if you have money. Let's say you retired years ago and you had all your money in a 401k. Now they force you out. I believe they raised the age to, I think it's 72 now. In the year you're turning 72, the government starts to force money out every year. So no matter what you decide to do, they start to force it out because the government wants that tax revenue. If it was a traditional IRA, it also has that required minimum distribution. So that traditional stuff, that pre-tax stuff has the required minimum distribution. Now, Roth IRAs don't have required minimum distributions, but those Roth 401ks, 403 b's, 457, they still have that. Although the money is tax-free, they still force you out at a certain age because it's an employer-based plan. So essentially, it's the government saying, we got we to gotta give you this money. But what happens is, if you are forced out of a traditional 401k, well, they're, they're not only getting that, that income, or if it's a just traditional IRA, you got to take it. But most people reinvest it if they don't need it. You can reinvest it. So, so Joan, a lot of people reinvest required minimum distributions. A lot of them, uh, there's a strategy you could... If you had a charitable organization you wanted to donate money to, you could, instead of taking that required minimum distribution, it's called a qualifying, qualified charitable distribution, a QCD. So, so some people who don't need the required money, just give it directly to an organization. So my father is one of those where he doesn't need the money he's taking out of one of his retirement plans. He literally just, it goes right to an organization he supports because it's, this is taxable income. So for some people, transferring it to another organization or charity helps them avoid that tax bill. But the government is gonna get their money now or later. So we're, we're all playing this tax game. Uh, so thank you, Joe, for reminding me about that. But yes, you can definitely reinvest it. You know, if you, if you, you know, have to, if you're forced out, or if you have that required amount. And the, the thing about required minimum distributions is, they, they make you take a little bit more every year. So the goal is by the time you reach, they don't, you know, they don't know when you're going to pass away, but the goal is if they, uh, as a part of this calculation, let's say you're age 72 and they expect you to live for 20 years, you'd essentially in there in this calculation, you're taking 120th. So you're 72, they expect you to live to 92, you're taking 120th of this account. That's how they kind of figure out the math, but there's a calculation that's done every year that again will force money out of your retirement plans. And, and this is why I love kind of the tax never bucket or maybe like the Roth IRA and the, the life insurance is because you're not forced out. So if you've had a Roth IRA and you know, you're 75, nobody's going to tell you, you got to take the money, you know? <laughs> so, so the, the idea is when you're thinking about retirement plans, and all of your various accounts, you, you got to think about what, what bucket am I going to tap first? It, it's a big question that a lot of people in retirement aren't comfortable making because sometimes we can forego that tax bill a little bit longer if we push it out a little further until they have to take it. So if I have something else to supplement my retirement, I don't have to start paying taxes on monies right away. 
or if I've if I've leveraged you know this Roth option and I've, I've done some Roth conversions and all the money is now in this Roth IRA, then nobody's ever going to come after me. But at some point, we do have to take we have to pay this tax bill at some point. So just again, as you're as you're thinking about your individual plans, there are a lot of things that you could be considering for retirement and a number of other things. But we are all having to play the tax game, and we cannot get away from it. This is why having a tax professional on your money team is important. This is why having a financial planner to help you sort through these scenarios is important. We, we have to stop doing this stuff on our own. We have to. Well, I'll take it back. We don't have to. I would highly recommend and I would suggest you consider working with a financial professional or multiple to help you have supreme clarity around not only just the retirement stuff we've talked about tonight, but everything that you're doing, you don't have to go at it alone. There are a lot of things you can do on your own. I, I'll, I'll give you that. But it's at a certain point, you should check in with an expert to make sure it, it's you to make sure you're doing what's in your best interest. All right. So that concludes my deck. And, and I, I wanted to finish up a little bit earlier on purpose. I know we've been running up against. <laughs> The, the the time, the last couple of sessions, but this was my last one with you. <clears throat> so I wanted to make sure I got through the content uh, to, with some time to spare and just kind of open it up for, uh, these could be retirement related questions. These could be general questions, but I wanted to give you all back this time here at the end, just to, you know, answer any final questions you might have before we, before we uh, sign off tonight. Uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, so let me, I'm going to type all this. So who's on your money team? You, me, try to type this out really quick for you. Uh, I've been out now, Charles, and I'll, I'll explain these briefly. Uh, let me make sure I got this all right. Let's make sure this one. I think I've got all these. I might be missing one. Um, as I talk about this money team, <clears throat> I, I say banker, but I, I mean like a banking relationship. And that could be with your actual bank or the credit union you, you support. So I think Reba was telling a great story about the service that she received of having somebody sit down and explain stuff. You want that type of a relationship. And if you have multiple banks or credit unions, having a relationship with them is helpful from a standpoint of knowing the product offerings they have, but also when it's time to get a loan, people need to know what you're doing. Whether it's individual loans, car loans, a business loan, you having that relationship allows somebody to go to bat for you. That, that's what get, if they don't know you, they just gonna give you the, the, the same run of the mill service you can get online. But having a relationship, people go a little bit further for you when they actually know you. And that, that's for anything in life. Investment professional, again, this could be retirement focused. This could be retail or general investment focused. This could be, again, a lot of different investments that you may consider. Maybe you have a point person for that. Insurance professionals, there's life insurance, there's there's, you know, property and casualty, like, you know, homeowners and car and uh, I'll say insurance professionals is probably what you need. There's not maybe that one person that can sell it all to you. Some, some investment or insurance professionals are licensed in multiple pieces, uh, mo not pieces. <laughs> they have multiple licenses that so they can serve you in a, in a number of ways. Financial planner. That's what I am. I like, I like being the quarterback sometimes, right? I can do the investments. I can do the insurance. I can also just do a plan for you. Doesn't involve me selling a product, but you're paying me for my time because I'm helping you to sort out your situation. There's value in that. There's value. So, uh, shout <laughs> all right, y'all. Tina's a real estate professional. All right, Tina. I just let everybody know. <laughs> so, shout out to Tina. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, real estate. You know, again, so many types of things you can do with real estate, having that professional 
super important person to have on your team. Attorneys, you may need multiple depending on what you're doing. You need maybe an estate planning attorney. Maybe you need a business attorney if you're if you're in business. A lot of different types you need there. But the the real play is you shouldn't be doing this stuff by yourself. I don't do it by myself. Oh, I know number seven, tax professional. I think I've already <laughs> just hit me. So tax professional. Some people do their own taxes. Great. But I'd rather make that investment and pay somebody to make sure I'm doing the right thing. So yeah, the, the seventh, I, I knew it was going to come to me is the tax professional is number seven. I'll type that in there just so somebody, actually I'll copy paste and that way we'll have the full list in one part of the chat. So when I talk to my clients, I always say, I'm pretty good in a couple of areas, but I also need you to have other people that you're working with so I can sometimes coordinate those efforts, right? I don't know it all. Don't claim to know it all. So if you don't agree with what I talk about, but I got a plan. I will hope you have a plan so you have that clarity and can move accordingly. Uh, so I see a couple of hands. I see with one question in the chat, and I'll come to you, to you, to you both here in a second. So we're gonna uh, so let's see. Questions around is there any value in starting a Roth after 72? If you already have an IRA. Maybe not. I, I would say probably not. Um, the, the thing about RMDs or IRAs in general, if you're trying to do an IRA, if you have earned income, meaning you're still actively drawing an income somehow, some way, you're still eligible to do an IRA. But if if you have one and you're already coming up against the requirement of distributions, you know, I, I don't think putting it back into a retirement vehicle is necessary. Just my my initial thoughts. I, I don't think it's necessary. You could you know, reinvest it elsewhere, but I don't necessarily think it needs to be in another, in another uh, retirement account specifically. All right. And then I'll go to Aria. Aria, I'll go to you first. I see you got your hand raised. Go ahead. Hi, Jasper. Hello. Um, so I'm not really sure how like age plays into like the significance of your retirement plan, because I just joined the 30s group and I'm happy to be here, but everything is like hitting me that I'm incredibly ignorant on the important things like retirement. So I have no idea where to start. And I think you might have like answered this question in um, saying, talk to someone, um, but where should I start? Because listening to like retirement information just kind of it just the the language the numbers everything just does not compute yeah. in my head yeah yeah where yeah. would you say to start you start i mean if we're talking just retirement planning specifically you start with what you got right now like do you have access to a 401k do you have an ira you just start there and it, let's say, do, or, or, do you have do you have a four hundred one k or an employer sponsored retirement plan? I did. Call me. See, see, y'all. This is this is the perfect setup, right? It's a yes or no answer. Like you either know or you don't know. But and I'm not trying to. This is this is what I love to do, right? Because it's that level. Like the fact that people can't just say yes or no means we need to have more conversation, and it is not just you. There are millions of people that I ask those questions and they just like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm like, mm, okay, we should be talking. So, so, so <laughs> it, it's, it's okay because you've already acknowledged the one thing that most people will not say, I don't know where to start. And you said it out loud in front of people. You are already <laughs> leaps and bounds ahead of people because you were able to verbalize it. That alone means you might be okay in the long run. I got people who are in their late sixties who still have not called me back and I've known them for a decade. That scares me. Yeah. I don't know how long it's going to take some people to wake up, but for some of us, we may not ever wake up. Yeah. So just the fact that you sharing that and being open and honest means you just about ready. We got to do a couple of things on the educational front. Mm -hmm. And you will have this sense of clarity and confidence around, okay, I, you know, that, 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 that twenties was, we had a good time. <laughs> I, I, I've been there I, again. I'm late. Well, yeah, almost late thirties. So I, I, I was there. 
A lot of friends blew a lot of money in their twenties. I'm like, all right, yeah, let's make up for it this next decade yeah. and make that make that a part of your your challenge. I didn't do what I probably should have done to start. Mm-hmm. So I don't worry about the past. I only think about what do I do to make this next decade the best that I can for me in a number of things, and we'll we'll lump in retirement right there too. So you're not alone. I appreciate you for sharing that. I just wish more people would call me and reach out and really start to sort through their, their plans yeah. because I'm always offering people just won't take me up on it. You know, I, I do my best to try to help, but you know, maybe I'm not the right cup of tea and I, I got to respect that, but you have a lot of options around who might be able to assist you. And if I can be of service, you, you let me know. Cool. Thank you. You got it. All right. I'm gonna try this. Is it Keandra? Sea Andrea. Sea Andrea. God, I, yeah. I tried. I swear I tried. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> it. I appreciate it. Uh, hi, Jasper. Thanks for taking my question. Um, yeah. I was most looking forward to this segment in the series because um, it's the thing that I'm probably the most unsure about of all the topics that we went over these um, past several weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, this one and insurance, even though I have insurance, but mm-hmm. um. <sighs> retirement I am often concerned um not necessarily personally but for myself um maybe but my husband and other family members about making it to retirement in a like um being healthy in retirement so what if you are unable to make it to retirement um in one piece basically um I you know, they have these insurance commercials like with Aflac. I don't know what mm-hmm. that is really. Mm-hmm. Um, and in early 2020, I learned about uh, life insurance with living benefits. Mm-hmm. And I'm just wondering about how do those things work far as making it to retirement? Like if you don't even make it uh, in a, I don't even know how to say it, but if you're not healthy enough to make it to retirement, health wise, where you can't work all the way until you're 70 or 65 or, or Mm -hmm. to make enough money, like, what do you do to, what safeguards do you take to prepare for those instances? Yeah, you have a financial plan, you have savings, you have disability insurance to protect your income stream. We didn't, we didn't really get into disability, but that's how you protect your income stream. So you may, maybe I can't work or I'm not healthy enough to really maximize the income that I would earn in my, those high earning years, which are usually those kind of, I'll say late forties, you know, kind of mid fifties is where most people are making the most money they've ever made. And then you kind of trickle down to, you know, retirement, right? So you got to protect your income. And I don't worry when I have a plan, but people who don't have a plan will worry. And that's for anything in life. If you set up the time to have the plan, then we can rule out some of these concerns where I can't predict the future, but if I have a plan, I'll sleep a lot better. And as life happens, maybe I reach that age and I realize that this plan helped me to get to this point. Because what I fear is that people who don't do the planning, they literally wake up and you're like, oh gosh, I'm you know, woo, getting close to retirement here and I haven't done anything. So, you know, <laughs> you're a little late, but so, so all we can do is the best we can. And I have, I got a handful of clients right now. I do I do more consulting and accountability stuff with them. And they were in just like a, a like in a bad space, right? Because they had those same fears that you had and that you expressed. You know, what if I don't make it? Well, let's plan to act as if we are going to make it. How about that? We can plan. You know, financial planning is about offense and defense. So anything insurance-based, that's defense. Anything retirement, I'll say investment related, that's offensive. See, most people don't want to talk about the defensive stuff because it's scary. It's boring. It's depressing. But if you don't have the foundation built and are protecting and solidifying the income, don't worry about investing because you ain't going to have no money to invest. (laughs) I mean, that's just the reality. So I think having a solid game plan will help everybody have that level of comfort. It helps everybody. So uh, Reba, I'm gonna come to you in one second. Give me a second here, everybody. I'm gonna do something special for y'all because um, I kind of I kind of see where this is going. So I have a small challenge for the group, and I'll be very honest with y'all. I'm always transparent. 
I'm going to post the link to my website. I think I share my email address a couple of times, but I, I got a feeling, you know, this is the last one. People are like, where, where did he go? So here's what I'm going to do. I make this offer after I leave most sessions. I need you to visit my website. I'm going to post it in the chat and you're going to fill out the contact us and you can specify exactly what you want to talk about. I'll give you a free 30 minutes. That's my offer. So I'm going to post it right now. So if you go to the buildwealthmovement.com, you fill out the contact us is at the bottom of my webpage. You can specify what topics you want to talk about. I'll tell you about all my services because I am in business. So I'll give you, I'll give you a little bit for the free. I mean, we've I've kind of given you six sessions worth, but okay, let's I'll give you another 30. So I have a good heart, y'all, but I am in business. So I want to help people, but I want to get the results. So free will only get you so far in life. And for me, a lot of times people want to just take full advantage of my expertise. But I think we've got a good idea of where we need to maybe go. But now here's your, here's your piece right here. Here it is. So the buildwealthmovement.com. Scroll down to the bottom. Fill out the contact us section. I'm going to follow up. Now, I'm going to give you all this, this, uh, this, this um, little nugget. I know it's right here at the top of the hour. So if you have to jump off, feel free to do so. I'm going to stick around for a few more minutes to finish this up and take Reba's last question. Uh, I'm expecting a baby in a couple of weeks, so I'm going to be out of touch after a couple of weeks. So if, if you can't schedule something in the next couple of weeks, just know I'll be around in June. So, so I, I give you all this offer. If I haven't heard from you by June, I'll know it wasn't a good time or it wasn't a good fit. But if you're really ready to get cooking, I got like another two week window where, again, schedules are filling up. But I don't think we should keep waiting for this. And I will keep giving this this offer because I want to help. And I do this, I've probably done this to hundreds of groups and very, I got to put an expiration date on it because some people try to wait, one lady waited two years, emailed me and said, can, you, can I still get some free time? So look, I'll give, if I haven't, you, you specify it was from Occur. Again, when you fill out the contact us section, just put Occur. So I'll know how to label it in my system. And, and again, if I can't schedule you within the next two weeks before I go out on, on this, uh, this, this, this fatherly leave, just know I'll honor that free session in June when I'm back in action. So again, go to the website, fill out the contact us. I'll give you that free half hour. All right. And let me see. And then Reba, I'll go ahead and finish it up with you. Go ahead, Reba. <clears throat> and thank you everybody for, for the remarks. Um, that was basically it. The um, the um, banker investment professional thing you put on there. That's that was that the email or was the www one you put on there? Uh, either one, Reba. I got I got I already made another you, Reba. So you get that free thirty minutes too. Oh, yeah. Just re yeah, I got you. Just go go ahead and reach out. I'm we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Okay, I just want to make sure that 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 I have the right contact for you. Yeah. That's all I was worried about. That www we build wealth movement. That's the contact I need to try to get to to reach to you. Yeah, you can. Yes, yeah, so that's that's my website. Yeah, so the okay. build the buildwealthmovement.com is my website. Scroll all the way to the bottom. Fill out the contact us and just specify that it was you know occur. So I'll know you were in this. If you don't put occur, I'm just going to assume you're somebody else. But again. I want to try to help, but I'm going to give you just 30 minutes. After that, we got to talk how we're going to work because free does not get results in my line of work. I've, I've tried. I can't help people for free. It's something about like it being free. They don't take it serious enough for some reason. So I, I know when, after we've had this talk, if you're willing to make a commitment to me, I definitely will make it to you. And investing in some time with me could be useful. You don't have to ever buy any products or services from me. Maybe it's just, Jasper, I need an additional hour with you. Let's sort it out. Let's sort it out. Okay. So uh, again, I, I just want to thank everybody. I know we're a little over time, but this is the last session. So I don't, I didn't mind doing it tonight. Uh, definitely want to thank Charla again. Like this wouldn't have been possible without her, y'all. She reached out again. She's like, hey, you want to run it back? I said, yeah, because <laughs> it, it was great last year too. So this year has been much of the same where we're, 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 we're making our mark, you know, and we're going to keep trying to do our part to help you all out and point you in the right direction to help you build your money team. But I'll leave y'all with this. If we connect 
and we have a real good heart to heart. You can be honest, like uh, Araya and Araya. I apologize if I, I said your name wrong. That was honesty at its finest. She just admitted what her issue was out loud. We can move forward now. If y'all can't be as real as she was and, and that transparent, I can't help you. Like it's just it's too hard when you can't admit that you have a, a issue or a concern. And, and so like that is that first step. I heard you saying that I was like, she gets it. Now let's get to work. So if we if we see her next year, y'all, just know if she's if she spent any time with me, it's gonna be a whole lot different. She's gonna come next on like year, I'm gonna be educated. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm gonna come you. back with my testimony. <laughs> right. So yeah, yeah. So thank you all. Thank you all. Um Charla, I'll throw it back to you. I think I've got everything in the chat down already. Um, okay. Yeah, just, you know, anything, any closing words you want to say to the group before we... I just want to say on? thank you, and I want to give you a round of applause. Everybody, I know, I know everybody was pumped and happy to have you um, speak and share your wonderful, wonderful wisdom. And um, I'm just one of your fans, one of your many fans. And we'll talk again soon. Um, and thank you all for attending um, another one of Occur's fantastic programs. Um, there's many more to come after this. Um, please join us again on Tuesday. And then we'll talk more about what's in store for the end of the year. Well, Charla, thank you. Thank you guys, too. I'm glad I finally caught the last one of, of them because I, I had no clue this was for, for people who was from Occur. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, we'll we'll do better next time to make sure that word gets out. Charlotte, but I'm glad you made it. It was in my email, but I, the way it was written, it's like, you know, I haven't been to the school in so long because I've been on Zoom to where I didn't realize that that my teacher had, you know, just given you all his students name. Oh, I he, see. He never, Mr. Washington never mentioned in his class session that, you know, if you guys are interested, it's another message from Earl Curry. Then I would have been in the first one, you know? But, <laughs> well, we'll get you. We've got you on the list now, Reva. So we will see you um, in our next series for sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Char Jasmine. Yeah, you're very well. Thanks, Charla. everybody. Okay. Charla, oh, yes. how do I, how do I um, save the chat so that I can have that? Um, I know there's some kind of way you can click it and uh, that's a good question. Uh, Simone, could you feel that? I'm not sure that you, I didn't know you could, but I if there's I'll a way, Simone honesty, knows. Right? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I did take down all the resources, so I'll be sure to include it in the email and I'll send it out to the RCP so everybody has access. Okay. Yeah, only, I think only the owner can do that. Only the owner can record it and, and, and do that. No, it's located. It's the three dots by the chat. I'm, I've been doing it all day. <laughs> okay. oh, let me see. The, the three dots by the chat. So you see what says type message here. You see the little smiley face, the three dots. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't oh, it's a that. safe chat. It sure does. Oh, I, you mean where I am? So oh, in the yes. chat where, where you would type your message. Oh, if you're I'm on a not... computer. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's three oh. dots to the right. Uh, there's uh -huh. a there's a page, page a smiley face yeah. and three dots all right thank you so much is that charles yeah taste a village oh that is, <laughs> yes, yes it charles. does <laughs> Char thank charles you so says, much charles says Jeffrey, five hours for that say, yeah <laughs> so, so i'm my questions on the new oh. baby you have you got to post on your website what you have one day I got, uh, my, my wife said, I'm not allowed to post for, uh, I don't know how long before I can post a photo of the baby. So well, not I'll, a photo, but just let us know if it's a boy oh, or a girl. Oh, for sure. We'll do. Yeah. After, okay. I'll do that for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Well, well, sorry, I'm on my phone. So can you please send that email out with the chat on it? Cause I'm on my phone. I can't do that recording. Yes. I'll send it to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And God, and God bless you, Jasper, because I'm going to have a grand, another, a grandson again too. All right. Looking forward to connecting with you, Reba. All right. Thank good you. Night. Guys, God bless you. Have a good one. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye, everybody.